this sermon um, I borrowed from Stephen Haskell. He has a book on Daniel. And the last time I preached, I did the third chapter, and I'm going back to the first chapter on this one. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Sabbath day that we can come together and worship you. I pray that you will be with me as I speak, that my words will be your words, and you will be with those that hear that there will be no distractions, and they will be blessed by the hearing of your word. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Although Daniel lived 2,500 years ago, he is a Latter-day prophet. His character should be studied, for his development reveals the secret of God's preparation of those who will welcome Christ at his appearing. Daniel begins the book with a simple statement that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, 1607 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came onto Jerusalem and besieged it. That in the siege, Jehoiakim was given by the Lord into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, but allowed to remain on the throne in Jerusalem. Yet Nebuchadnezzar carried with him to Babylon as tribute, a part of the vessels of the house of God, and as hostages, some of the members of the royal household. This act, with similar ones which followed in swift succession, was but the accumulation of events which began years before. In order to appreciate this climax, it is essential that we study the cause which led to it. Since the captivity of Judah is an object lesson to people of the last generation, it is doubly necessary that we trace the relationship between certain causes and results. God had an object in calling the Jewish nation to separate themselves from the other nations of the world. It was that his people might stand before the world as light bearers, as a beacon set on a hill, Israel was to send beams of light to the world. The plan of education made known to Israel through her prophets was the means of keeping that light burning. When this God-given plan was neglected, the light as a candle deprived of the life-giving oxygen burned dim. Then it was that the nation was pressed upon all sides by the foe. There is a Hebrew saying which states that Jerusalem was destroyed because, her education, because the education of her children was neglected. The prophecies of Daniel and the connected history prove the truth of this maxim. It may be added that the Jews were restored to, re to Jerusalem as the result of the proper education of a few Hebrew boys. Just about 100 years before the days of Daniel, Hezekiah was king of Judah. After a reign of 13 years, he was on his deathbed, but he pleaded with God to lengthen his life. On the king's recovery, he was visited by ambassadors from Babylon, to whom he showed all his treasures. They came to hear the mighty God that could heal the sick, but he showed them only earthly treasure. He lost the opportunity to give them of the treasure of heaven. Then came a message from God by the hand of the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold, the days shall come that all that is in thine house shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left. He was also at the same time told that his descendants should be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. There, here was portrayed the future captivity of the Hebrew race. The prophecy was placed on record and repeated again and again by Jewish mothers as they taught their children. Must my son be a captive in the court of a heathen king? Then let me train him so that he will be true to the God of his fathers. There were other mothers who lightly let, the, let pass the thought and the history of their son's life is recorded for our instruction. Three years after his life had been saved, a son was born to Hezekiah. Notwithstanding the recent prophecy, Hezekiah and his wife, Hephzibah, failed to 
teach the young Manasseh in the way of truth. He was only 12 years of age when he came to the throne. But if he had been trained in the fear of God, he would not have chosen the worship of the heathen. The youthful Christ at the age, at the same age, settled not only his own destiny, but the destiny of the universe. Then, 12 years of age, standing on the temple in Jerusalem, his future work opened before him, and he accepted his appointed mission. Why? Because Mary, his mother, had taught him that heart service to God was his highest pleasure. Manasseh decided in favor of the heathen deities, did evil in the sight of God, and for the sins of Manasseh came the captivity of Judah. At the age of 12 years, Christ made a decision which saved the world. At the same age, Manasseh chose a course which brought ruin to the nation. In the training of our children, are you Hephzibah or Mary? The long reign of Manasseh passed, and the prophecy sent to Hezekiah was not yet fulfilled. Men began to wonder if it ever would come to pass. Since the fathers fell asleep, said they, all things continue as they were. It was in the days of Josiah, the grandson of Manasseh, that Jeremiah prophesied through the prophet God. Through the prophet, God pleaded with Jerusalem to return to him. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from afar, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you knowest not. Thus was Babylon described, and Jerusalem's impending doom portrayed. Josiah was spared the sight of the completion of the destruction of Jerusalem because of the reforms which he attempted. In his days there was kept by Judah and by Israel also the greatest Passover feast in the history of the nation. Because thine heart was tender, and now hast humbled thyself before the Lord, behold, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. In a peculiar way, God gave Josiah an opportunity to avert the impending calamity. It was not yet too late to change the course of events. This opportunity was through the gifts of his sons. Josiah had three sons and one grandson, who were in turn seated on the throne at Jerusalem. Each, because of wrong training in youth, refused to take God at his word, and failing, hastened the, follow, the final overthrow. The three, hun the three sons were Jehoiaz, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. The grandson was Jehoiakim, who preceded his uncle, Zedekiah. The fate of each is a solemn warning to people living at the end of time. He who might have been the light of heathen nations was swallowed up by Egyptian darkness. Jehoiakim II, who, if properly trained, would have been charged with the power of God, paid tribute to Babylon. His capital was entered Treasures from the house of God were ruthlessly torn from their place and dedicated to heathen worship. Youth, bright, promising youth, were taken from the royal family to serve the king of Babylon. Jehoiakim beheld this but was powerless to interfere. With his life was gone, he was not connected with the throne of God. His mother and his father made a fatal mistake for they did not give him the training which God had commanded them to give. Neither did he profit from these mistakes, but educated his son in courtly manners and in the philosophy of the world. And as a result, his son Jehoiakim languished nearly, 35, 30, nearly 37 years in a prison in Babylon. This was another lamp without the oil, another soul without the heavenly food, another son improperly trained to add to the disgrace of Judah. Jerusalem was destroyed because the education of her children was neglected. Zedekiah, the third son of Josiah, still had an opportunity to save Jerusalem. Part of the treasures of his city were already in Babylon. Daniel and his companions had been in the court 17 or 18 years 
when Jeremiah came to Zedekiah with the words, If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then, thou, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well with thee, and thy soul shall live. In this time of peril, how did Zedekiah act? Did he deliver himself unto the Babylonians? God had commanded it. The city would have been saved by it. His own soul would have been saved. Zedekiah pleaded a most human excuse, saying, I am afraid. In these three sons is revealed the weakness, the cowardice, the wickedness, and the final ruin of those trained for the service of the world and not for the service of God. Living in the same time and in the same city with the princes already named were others which the scripture mentions by name. These were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the children of Judah. Of the royal family, relatives of Jehoiaz, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. At the first siege of Jerusalem, 1607 BC, Daniel was not over 18 years of age, but about the age of the prince Zedekiah who afterward, afterward ruled in Jerusalem. Daniel had a godly mother who knew of the prophecy concerning of the destruction of their city. She repeated to her son the words of God, that someday Hebrew children must stand in the heathen court at Babylon. Carefully did this mother teach her son to read the parchment scrolls of the prophets. The history of Israel was studied. The story of Nadab and Abihu was told and retold. The effect of strong drink was impressed upon the mind. The laws of his own were of, of his own being were studied. He knew that excess in eating and drinking would so dull the mind that the voice of God could not be heard. The songs which these Hebrew children sang told the story of God's dealings with his people. It was in this manner that the image of God was engraved on their hearts. This education was not gained in the schools of the time, for they had departed from the plan of God. But holy mothers, living closely to the everlasting Father, led their children by precept and example, by word and song, to form characters that would stand the test. It was the age when most of the young men in the capital of Judah were wild and reckless. They were excusing themselves because of their youth. But God chose from their midst certain ones whom he could trust in a foreign land. Daniel and his three companions were snatched from the shelter of home and with others were placed under the charge of Ashpenaz, master of the eunuchs in Babylon. Now can be seen the results of the home training. Pure, pure food Clean thoughts and physical exercise placed them on the list of children who, in whom was no blemish but well favored. But what of their intellectual ability? They had not been educated in the schools of Jerusalem, much less in those of Babylon. Was there not great danger that they lacked in the sciences of the essential branch, branches? On examination, these four passed as skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and able to learn a difficult foreign language, God had fulfilled his promise in these children of the home school. The crucial moment came when the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. Daniel had unbounded confidence in the principles of temperance, not alone because he knew them to be scientifically true, but because they were God-given. And in, this, in, in his case, had been put into practice. His education had a biblical foundation, and he knew that it was in harmony with the true science. It was a life and death question, but the principles were divine, and he would obey. Walk by faith and leave the results with his maker. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor the wine which he drank. 
the language of the prince of the eunuchs shows that there were other Hebrew youth who were selected who did not make this request. For, said the prince of the eunuchs, why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of this sort? Daniel and his companions, after conspiring their dangerous and difficult position, took this matter to the Lord in prayer and decided to be true to principle. Much was involved in this decision. If they sat at the king's table, they would partake of food which had been consecrated, consecrated to idols, and the Hebrew children would thus dishonor God and ruin their own characters by removing the safeguard of temperance and allowing themselves to be influenced by corrupt associations. Even at the cost of appearing singular, they decided not to sit at the table of the king. They might have reasoned that at the king's command, they were compelled to partake of the food at the royal table, which had been dedicated to an idol. But they determined not to implicate themselves with heathenism and not to dishonor the principles of their national religion and their God. Surrounded by perils and having made most determined effort to resist temptation, they must trust the results with God. With true courage and Christian courtesy, Daniel said to the officers who had charge over them, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them, them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenances of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with, deal with thy servants. It was no experiment with them, for they foresaw the result. The officer hesitated. He feared the rigid abstinence they proposed would, be un, would have an unfavorable effect upon their personal appearance, and that, in consequence, they would lose favor with the king. The Hebrew children explained to the officer the effect of food upon their body. The overeating and use of rich foods benumbed the sensibilities, unfitting mind and body for hard, stern labor. They urged most earnestly that they be allowed the simple diet and begged that they be given a 10 days trial that they might demonstrate by their own physical appearance at the end of the time the advantages of plain nutritious food. The, regret, the request was granted, for they had obtained favor with God and with men. It was an act of faith. There was no feeling of envy towards those who were eating of the king's meat. The minds of the four were filled with thoughts of love and peace, and they actually grew during those ten days. God approved of their course, for in the end of ten days their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. The clear sparkle of the eye, the ruddy, healthy glow of the countenance, bespoke physical soundness and moral purity. The Hebrew captains were therefore allowed to have their chosen food. The character of Daniel, as a referred to by Ezekiel, who was a contemporary prophet as re representing those who will live just before the second coming of Christ. People will be called to pass through experiences which require the keenest spiritual eyesight. Therefore, God asks them to give up all things which will in any way check the flow of this Holy Spirit through the mind. Herein lies the reason of strict adherence to the principles of health reform. Daniel and his companions gained the victory on the point of appetite. This was the avenue and the only one through which Satan was permitted to tempt Adam. And had Adam proved true in the Garden of Eden and not eat of the forbidden fruit, sin and suffering would never have been known. Appetite was the open door through which came all the results of sin, which for in 6,000 years has been so manifest in the human family. As Christ entered upon the work of his ministry, he began where Adam fell. 
first temptation in the wilderness was on the point of appetite. Here the Savior, Savior bridged the gulf which sin had made. He, redeer, he redeemed the whole family of Adam and wrought out a victory for the people, for the benefit of all who are thus tempted. In the last days, God will prove his people as he proved Daniel. A voluntary self-control of appetite lies at the foundation of every reform. Daniel and his companions passed through a strange school in which to, be, in which to become fitted for lives of sobriety, industry, and faithfulness. Surrounded with courtly grandeur, hypocrisy, and paganism, they exercised self-denial and sought to acquit themselves so creditably that the Israelites, their downtrodden people, might be honored and that God's name might be glorified. These children had the Lord as their educator. They were connected with the fountainhead of wisdom by the golden channel, the Holy Spirit. They kept continually a living connection with God, walking with him as did Enoch. They were determined to gain a true education and in consequence of their co-partnership with the divine nature, they became in every sense complete men in Jesus Christ. While diligently applying themselves to gain a knowledge of the languages and sciences, they also really received light directly from heaven's throne and read God's mysteries for future ages. When, when at the end of three years, King Nebuchadnezzar tested the ability and acquirements of the royal princes from nations whom he had been educated, none were found equal to the Hebrew youth. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they surpassed their associates tenfold in their keen apprehension, their choice and correct language, and their extensive and varied knowledge. The vigor and strength of their mental powers were unimpaired. Hence, they stood before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of him, of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. These youth respected their own manhood and their entrusted talents. And their entrusted talents had not been enfeebled or perverted by indul indulgence of appetite. The good they wished to accomplish was ever in mind. They were faithful in the little things. God honored them, for they honored him. God always honors adherence to principle. Among all, of all the most promising youth gathered from the land subdued by Nebuchadnezzar, the Hebrew captives stood unrivaled. Their regard for nature's laws and the God of nature was revealed in the erect form, the elastic step, the fair countenance, the untainted breath, the undimmed senses. It was not by chance that they attained to their marvelous wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The foundation of the highest education is religious principle. Faith had been developed in childhood, and when these youth had to act for themselves, they depended upon God for strength and efficiency in their labors and they were richly rewarded. The last words of the final chapter of Daniel are truly significant. Daniel continued even onto the first year of King Cyrus. In other words, Daniel lived all the days of the Babylonian captivity over 70 years and had the pleasure of knowing that Cyrus, whose name the prophet Isaiah had mentioned nearly two hundred years before he had issued his wonderful decree for the diversions of God's people. Okay. Do we have a closing song?
Okay. Sowing in the morning, the sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontide and the dewy eve, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves.